My name is Mark Hoffman. I am the uh, Small Fruits Extension Specialist at NC State. And uh, today I will try to um, explain growing grapes in 45 minutes, which, <laughs> we're, uh, which is kind of a challenge, but we will, we will go over it. So, so this is a, so we work in the Southeast, we work together with two different universities, especially on grapes with the University of Georgia and Virginia Tech. So a lot of this is um, material which we work together on and I, I will share that with you right now. Um, so the anti grape and wine industry in North Carolina uh, is growing a lot. And we have at the moment more than 500 grape growers and about 200 wineries. We have 2,300 acres of vineyard. And, uh, and uh, we have nearly double the amount of cases of wine producing from 2013 to 2016. And um, we attract about 2 million tourists in 2016. And uh, we have more than 10,000 wine industry related jobs right now. But grapes are not an easy crop to grow in North Carolina. And the vineyard and winery is very expensive. So today we will talk about two different things. First of all, if you want to grow a couple of grapes in your backyard, or if you want to actually put in a vineyard. So we will cover both, both of those things. And um, uh, first we go about early considerations, what you need to know before you grow grapes. Also, we look a little bit deeper into like site selection and what type of soil do you need and, and how do you need to prepare your soil before you grow your grapes. And we will also talk about varieties. Um, basic establishment, we will talk a little bit about diseases, but Matt uh, is going to cover that later a little bit more in, um, in detail. And then we will uh, talk about the extension resources which you can use and which you should use if you uh, want to grow grapes. So early considerations. Um, the first thing you need to know is really what do I want to do with the grapes before you put the plants into the ground. So do you want to do, do you want to uh, have fresh market? Do you want to harvest the fruit and want to eat the fruit or do you want to make wine and juice? Because that has, a, uh, has an impact on your variety choice and, and also on your later business plan. Um, and um, you also need to know how many plants do I want to know. So, and what you really need to know is um, the more plants you want to grow, the more labor intensive it gets. And everything which gets more than over an acre can be very labor intensive depending on the variety and depending where you're at. And everything about over three or four acres, you will need some additional full-time labor, at least at certain uh, times of the year. So that is really something which you need to know. You need to understand the labor and capital demands, especially if you, if you um, plan to, uh, to grow a larger acreage of grapes. Um, so again, if you, only, if you only grow a couple of grapes in your backyard, that's not, very, that's not a big investment. It's not very expensive. But if you plan to grow a vineyard, uh, everything which is over an acre can get very labor intensive and can get very expensive. And usually a vineyard after three years, you have an investment of, of about $25,000 per acre and you get your first returns after three years. So again, there must be a distinction between do you wanna grow some grapes in the backyard or do you want to grow a whole vineyard? Um, and this is just quick. Some of the equipment you would need to know if you're planning to grow a larger acreage uh, if you don't have it, those are the kind of um, investment um, which you look at in the first couple of years. And a business plan would be also very important. We're not going over all this, but what you need to, what you should do if you would start planning uh, to plant some grapes, you should join the grower associations, um, especially the Muscadine Grape Grower Association. Um, if you plan to grow some uh, uh, Muscadine grapes in your backyard, and also try to uh, reach out to the extension service before you plant. We were gonna go over this in a couple of minutes again. That is really important. We can help you before you actually do some mistakes. Um, also, if you plan to grow a larger acreage, um, you do have some upfront costs, um, which is here the blue bar. 
and um, this is for a 10 acre vineyard if you grow if you want if you want to if you want to grow something smaller um, you will still have some upfront costs like trellis and land preparation, etc. You're going to have to be prepared to have those capital assessed assets and your returns. A really, a vineyard gets profitable after 10 to 15 years. Um, so, as I said, it takes a considerable amount of time, 10 to 15 years for a vineyard to become profitable. If you, again, this is only if you plan to grow a larger acreage, you know, one, two or three acres as, as, as some sort of a retirement project. Um, and perhaps never if the scale of operation is too small relative to the capital investment you have. So this is something you, you, you have, which is really important. I see a lot of people making those mistakes, They're putting in grapes and then, um, and then after five, six years, they're not getting the returns with, uh, relative to what they invested. Um, so um, row spacing and vine trending is very important. That's where we talk about this in a second. And, um, and the capital and operating costs can discourage many from, from, from putting in a vineyard, but again, putting in a couple of grapes in your backyard is a completely different endeavor and actually a lot of fun to do. So a couple of things about the site selection. The most important aspect of your site is uh, drainage. And there are two types of drainage which, are really, which, are, which do really affect grapes. It's air drainage and water drainage. And we talk about both. And if you do that right, you actually, you actually have, um, have done 50% of your work already. So uh, a sloped convex land is really good for grapes because you want to have your airflow actually, your cold air flowing through the vineyard and not being stuck in the vineyard. If you have, if you have a, a sink and you plant your grapes into a sink, that sets you up for a lot of cold damage in the winter and a lot of frost damage in the spring. Um, so this is really one of the biggest, biggest parts. If, if you plant a vineyard, you need to make sure that you are on a little bit elevated land, even, even in, the, uh, in, the, um, in the upper plains. Try to find some land which is a little bit elevated from the surroundings um, so that you can do have some air, so that you don't have those, those cold air pockets where uh, your grapes will die. This is, this is true for both muscadines and for vinifera grapes. Um, and the reason why that is, is because you have usually, you have a cold plateau and at the top and you have uh, cold air is heavier than warm air. So cold air will sink into a, uh, will drain into the lower areas of your land. And if you have grapes in your low areas, you will have a lot of cold air, you will have a lot of cold air which are in this pocket and then your grapes uh, will see, will show cold damage over winter, which is a leading cause of dieback in all vineyards here in North Carolina. So you really want to make sure that you have good air drainage and you really want to make sure that your grapes which you plant are not in a spot where they are affected by a lot of cold air. Another very important part is water drainage. Um, so wines do not like water. Um, they don't like wet feet and that's really important, especially in the Eastern Plains and especially with muscadines. Um, expect of the first two years where you have to water maybe wines, but you should definitely keep them moist. But after they are established, um, they don't want to be uh, in, in wet fields. So, and what we find in the Eastern Plains a lot is we have those hard pans in the first 40 or 50 inches of depth in the soil. And if this hard pan is, is, too, is, is in the first 40 or 30 inches, it will lead to a lot of flooding, especially after heavy rainfalls. And um, that can lead to a lot, of, a lot of problems in your vineyard. You, you, your wines will be affected. They will show lower growth. They will get uh, easier diseases. They will be stressed out. And in the worst case scenario, they will actually die. So <clears throat> having water, having standing water in your vineyard, like you see in this picture here, is, uh, that's not a good field site. You do want to observe uh, whether or not you have uh, standing water in your field site before you plant. And, um, 
And usually you want to preserve it after heavy rainfalls and you do want to avoid those type of situations and those type of um, uh, those sites. So it's again, it's better to put your grapes a little bit on elevated land and test your soil, ask your extension specialist or your extension agent to come out with you and test your soil um, and see if there's a hard pan before you start planting your grapes. So. And, and Mark, would that yeah. really just be digging a hole? Just digging and see what you encounter? Yeah, so, so, so usually we go out with an auger, but you also can go out with a shovel. It's just more of work with a shovel. So you, you, can, you, can, dig a pan, you can dig a hole and see if you find um, some, some clay or some really hard pen. So often you've, you've, it's really hard. I mean, it's almost like concrete if you find it. And, um, and it's hard to dig through. And, and um, if you find that, if you can reach it with a shovel, it's not a good idea to plant a grape there. Be because, you know, it, in, in the first 40 or 50 inches, you can get a lot of rain and then you have situations like you have here in this, in this, in this, um, in this vineyard. So that's really something you want to look out for before you plant your grapes, because that sets you up for a lot of problems. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, some other considerations about soil. Um, the pH is also very important. We do have a lot of acidic soils here in North Carolina. And, um, and we recommend a pH range between six and seven, roughly, for grapes. If you get much lower, if, you, if you're below 5.5, if you're below 5 .5, you will have a lot of problems with uh, the avail availability of plant nutrients. Uh, the, the plants cannot take up the nutrients which they should. And that again will lead to nutrient deficiency and a stressed out plant and, and, and more problems in your vineyard. So um, often the soils in North Carolina and most regions are actually uh, somewhere around, around uh, 4.5 to 6 or 5.5. So you usually want to adjust your soil pH before you plant a, a grape um, in the soil. So especially calcium magnesium can be, uh, can be very deficient if you are in lower pH soils, which then again affect plant growth and, and fruit development. So what you want to do before you plant a grape is you want to test your soil and you should do that at least half a year in advance. Um, and you want to test your soil in the first six inches and then again in, the, in, in six to 12 inches there because that's where usually your roots are with grapes. And in both of those areas, you're shooting for a pH between 6.0 and 7.0. And you can send your samples to the NC Department of Agriculture to the agronomy service. They test your samples for you and uh, will give you a, a pH range. And they also will give you a recommendation if your pH is lower than six, to apply lime before planting, they will give you a recommendation how much lime you're going to have to apply. Um, so usually, what you want to do is you want to use a you want to use uh, you want to take a composite soil sample. So you take about ten, have ten different uh, spots at your field site where you take a bucket and then you you, you dig a hole from. Uh, in the first six inches, and then again, you go down 12 to, uh, to, to six to 12 inches, and um, you take two different composite soil samples, mix it up, talk to the extension agent. They have, they have the, uh, the containers which you can ship to the NC Department of Agriculture here in Raleigh, and they test it for you. And, um, and then if your pH is lower than six, you will have to apply, you should apply lime before planting because it is much easier to apply lime lime before planting than to do it afterwards. Um, so in summary, if you start, if you want to grow some grapes, start planting that about a year before, if, if you, or at least half a year if you, if you plant a few grapes in your backyard. Test your soil, it's very important. Make sure that you do have good air drainage. Make sure you have good, you don't have standing water or you're not in in, in some sort of an erosion channel in the mountains. That's not a good spot for grapes. And contact your local extension agent. They, they will help you to, uh, uh, with the soil sampling, or at least they will explain you how to do the soil sampling. And, and, um, 
and talk to your specialists if you have questions. Um, so before we move on to varieties, does anybody have questions about that? There's a question in the chat box that um, right. if pH is lower on the bottom half of the sample but sufficient in the upper six inches, how do you adjust? How do you adjust your pH um, if no recommendation is made? So you send the sample off, and NCDA doesn't tell you to add more lime because it's good in the top six inches, but it's low in that bottom right, six inches. Right. What do you do? So for grapes, you, you still would have to apply lime because grapes, the, the roots are going very deep and usually it's more the six to 12 inches depth which you're concerned about than the first six inches. Because, and we talk about this in a second, but because you, 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 you um, plant grapes relatively deep and that is the area where your roots usually are. So, so you still would have to apply lime. You probably would have to work it in. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, that was from Mark in Orange County. He said, thanks. Right. And we have another question about what direction facing slope is best? Uh, so usually you would go with your air drainage and your water drainage. So those are the most important parts for, you, for, your, um, for your slope. And then the, the third, so if you have good air drainage and if you have good water drainage and you can do it in the north-south direction, that's a good, good idea. But the north-south direction is not imperative. It is more important to have good water drainage and to make sure that you find a spot where you don't have cold damage. So those are the most important parts. Any other questions? Nothing else in the chat list. All right. I will go over varieties now. So, <clears throat> and uh, varieties are very important and the location is very important too. So you cannot grow every variety everywhere in North Carolina. We have a very diverse climate as everybody knows in North Carolina. And we have several regions where we don't recommend to grow grapes at all because it's too cold. But then we have most of the regions in North Carolina. North Carolina. Most of the regions in North Carolina um, we can grow some sort of grapes. So everything which is yellow here, we don't recommend to grow vinifer varieties. If there, and there's a reason for that, which, 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 uh, which, which I will talk about in a second. Um, there are some vinifer varieties which you can grow in those areas, but most vinifera and most French American hybrids should not be grown in those varieties. Everything which is green, you can grow some vinifera varieties, some French American hybrids and muscadines. And then everything which is blue, you can go with late butt breaking viniferas, French American hybrids and some muscadines in special locations over there. Um, and we talk about this in a second, but this is very important to keep in mind. Um, and one of the major reasons, so there are a couple of reasons why this is the case, uh, the humidity and our climate is one of the reasons um, another major reason is the Pierce's disease, which, which is a, 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 a bacterium which can kill grapes. Uh, some, the muscadines are not affected by it, but most other grapes are. There are a few exceptions. And that really limits your site selection to a certain area in North Carolina where you have stronger winter, winters and colder winters where the bacterium actually can um, not survive. And, and so that you don't have that much uh, pathogen and pest pressure than you have in other areas of North Carolina. Um, so if you, and again, it is important to know what you want to do with your, with your grapes. If you want to do fresh fruit and you want to do it in your, in your uh, in, you want, if you want to do fresh fruit, uh, muscadines are a very good choice. So you, there are a couple of fresh fruit varieties and muscadines which do grow very well here in most of the areas here in North Carolina. Um, uh, we have a couple of prawns varieties. They are all self-fertile. The ones which I, which I showed here is Hall, Late Fry. There's a new one, Ho Oh My, or Tara or Triumph, which do work very well in North Carolina. And also dark varieties like Ison, Lane, Nesbit or Pork, which is a new variety. 
um, released by University of, University of Georgia, also work very well here. There's, those are all self-fertile varieties, which you, you, so you don't have to worry about a female and uh, uh, a, a safe uh, and a, uh, a fertile uh, a, 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 a fertile um, male who basically fertilize the female. Those are all self-fertile varieties. Um, in some areas in, in, in North Carolina, especially in the northern Piedmont region, uh, table grapes are very popular and they work very well there, uh, especially the varieties Mars, Joy and Faith can be are grown in, in the northern Piedmont a lot. And then uh, Sunbelt or Concord, Niagara and Catawba, which are all American uh, varieties, uh, can be grown, especially in the Piedmont region and, and in the Eastern Plains um, very well. So those would be those would be my recommendations if you if you want to go for fresh fruit varieties if you want to you know, pick your grapes or if you want to go into the fresh fruit business this is what you would do so those varieties probably don't work very well in the upper in the mountains or the high elevation with the exception of Concord maybe and the Yakran and Catawba uh, those varieties would probably not work very well in the uh, in the mountains um, so if you choose to grow for wine or for juice, that's a bigger endeavor also. So because you need a little bit high, more acreage to actually produce enough juice and wine. Um, again, there are some muscadines which work very well here. In the Provence varieties are Doreen, Magnolia, Carlos. Those are the ones which are used mostly for muscadine or noble as a dark one for muscadine wine, muscadine juice. Um, American varieties like Norton, of uh, Catawba and Niagara, they work very well in North Carolina as well, especially if you go to the Piedmont or into the mountains. Blanc du Bois is a, another variety which is Pierce disease, disease resistance and can be grown in North Carolina as well. Um, French American hybrids, Chamberson, Chardonnay, Vidal Plan are good varieties for North Carolina. They seem to work very well, especially Chamberson, which is a red variety seems to work very well. Again, they're not Pierce disease resistant, so they're more for the upper Piedmont and for the, for the, uh, the, the foothills and the mountains. And Petit Mansang, Petit Verdot, and Cap Fraud to a certain extent uh, are good variety, vinifera varieties. Petit Mansang, Petit Verdot do seem to like it in North Carolina. Again, for the, they are not Pierce disease resistant, but they don't have a lot of other problems. They're relatively, relatively easy to grow wine grape varieties here in North Carolina. Um, varieties which I would not recommend for somebody who starts a vineyard and who doesn't have experience, people grow it here, um, but they are more, uh, they are harder to grow, are Chardonnay or Caps Off, Riesling, uh, Merlot, Cruna Veltina, Tremonet can be tricky. Montepulciano can be tricky, Seval, Sangiovese, those are all very tricky varieties. And Pinot, um, there is a no in Pinot, and it's there for a reason. It's not working very well here in North Carolina. Again, if you have more experience, or if you have somebody who has experience in growing grapes, you might, you might want to try some of those varieties. But if you are a starter, or if it's only for, your, for yourself, I would not. I would not uh, recommend to use those varieties. Um, again, variety and type is important. And here's a little overview uh, and and uh, overview about uh, about a couple of varieties and the winter hardiness, which is a very important part here, and also the uh, the harvest season, which basically gives you a um, a uh, a good overview about when the bud break is. So you see Chardonnay is, a, is, a, is a early, it has a very early bud break and it is relatively winter hardy, but you often get frost damage in Chardonnay. That's why it's so hard to grow. It's a very, it's a very good variety. The winery demand is high, but it's not easy to grow. Um, a couple of more varieties here. Um, some of the red varieties. Again, Petit Verdot and Petit Mensang uh, relatively easy to grow varieties if you want to do go into the wine market. So as a general rule, um, 
French American hybrids and vinifera varieties need more attention, more care than masculine and American varieties. There are a lot of regions in North Carolina where you cannot grow uh, American hybrids of, of vinifera, especially in the eastern uh, part of North Carolina and, and, and the southern Piedmont. It is hard to grow those those type of grapes uh, because of Pierce's disease uh, pressure uh, and the, also the heat, which is there in the summer. Um, and as a second rule, if you do plan to be commercial, so if you plan to put in more than one or two acres of vineyard, you should have a, a business plan, plan. You should start planning this at least two years in advance. And you should assess your customer base and talk to the winemakers or to your custom crush operation before you put in your plans and talk to the extension service again and to me um, before you put in your plans. We are, we are, we are, we are happy to help you with, with every question you have. Um, uh, is anybody has, has anybody questions? Are there any questions in the chat? No questions in the chat. All right. Um, so vineyard design. Uh, so vineyards are very complex. And if you, if, if, again, if you want to put in a small vineyard, uh, row spacing and vine spacing, cotton spur and head cane pruning. And uh, the, the training systems are very, very important. And generally you are, you are in the business of uh, harvesting sunlight with grapes, which uh, is really important for two, for two reasons. The first reason is you want to ripen your fruit. And the second reason is that usually on your, on your wood, which is developing in the first year, um, uh, the buds which are on your wood, if they get enough, if they are in a shaded spot, they're, just, they're more likely to produce a, a vegetative shoot and if they're getting more sunlight, they're more likely to develop fruit in the next year. So you're really in the business of harvesting sunlight and, and the row spacing uh, is imp extremely important to make sure that your uh, uh, wines do get enough sunlight. As you can see here with a small row spacing like four to six inches, you're looking about four to five hours of sunlight at the six, at, at six foot of height. If, while, if you have a, a six foot row spacing, you are looking at six hours. And with the nine foot row spacing, you're looking at eight hours um, and 12 minutes in this case. Um, so row spacing, of course, the wider your row is, the less yields you have because you have less plants per acre. And um, this is a question which came up earlier, the row orientation. Um, Again, airflow and water drainage are the most important parts here in North Carolina. Make sure that you that you have your water that your water can flow through the vineyard and that your air that your rows are not blocking the airflow. And other than that, a north-south orientation would be good. Also, very important if you plan a vineyard, you need to be able to access it with your with your equipment. You need to make sure that you have a a, a twenty to thirty foot turnaround space around your vineyard for a tractor and other equipment so that you're not getting stuck in, in the vineyard. Those are all important aspects of vineyard planning before you put in your grapes. Um, a typical wine spacing on a VSP, a vertical shoot positioning system, which we have here and which is most commonly used here in North Carolina, is five to six feet between the wines uh, in vinifera and French American hybrids. Uh, with muscadines, you want to have a much wider spacing. You want to have about 20 feet between the vines and muscadines because they're very vigorous and they need more space to grow. And you want to have about 10 feet between American varieties like a Norton, for example, or a Catawba uh, grape. So, um, so now I want like to go over like the first three years of grape growing here in North Carolina. And I start with year zero, which is the year before you put in your grapes. Um, so really what you need to do in year, year, uh, in year zero is talk to the extension service. Let us know that you're planning to grow, grow some grapes. Uh, do your soil analysis. 
probably have to lie, put in lime. You probably have to uh, work it in. And uh, if you put in a bigger acreage of grapes, it is very recommendable to put an irrigation system to. If you only have a few acres, you can do that by hand. But if you uh, put in a bigger acreage of grapes, an irrigation system uh, does make a lot of sense. Um, again, this is, this is a, an overview about what your desired pH is and how much, uh, how much lime you will have to put in. Um, I, I've shared this presentation uh, uh, with uh, Charlotte and, and she will share it with you, hopefully. Um, again, if you have a lot of pressure like deers or bears or turkeys, which can actually eat your grapes, you will have to think about a fence. Fence is very expensive, but it will keep uh, uh, your, 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 your animal pressure out. And um, again, try to select and order your varieties about a year before latest in fall so that you can uh, plant in spring and don't rush it. That's the most important part. Make sure that everything is in place. Make sure you have your fencing, your equipment, your basic equipment, like your grow tubes there. Make sure you have your pH in, in order. Make sure you, you have a good spot where you do have enough air drainage and water uh, water drainage and then order your plants and latest latest in, in fall so that you can spring, spring. so that so you that can you can order in spring. spring somebody has his microphone on um so this is how it would look like a little bit if you have a uh, a wooded area here and you have already an existing type of road here. This is where you would put in your vineyard. You, again, you, you can see here, you have enough space for tur turnaround space at the rows and you will have to put in a fence here and here if you do have, uh, in the, if you do have animal pressure. Again, so it can be a very expensive endeavor and um, planting usually uh, occurs in the first year after you already have adjusted your lime and after you know what kind of varieties you want to grow. Usually you plant in the spring, uh, uh, in the first year, um, between April 1st and May 31st. Try, it depends on the region, but wait with planting until you have, uh, until the, the, fir the last frost is gone. Um, but you want to give the, the wine a chance to establish over the whole year. And your goal for the first year is really to grow a good root system and to grow a healthy, healthy trunk. Um, it is very important to purchase your nurses from certified disease-free stock. Uh, you can do a lot of things wrong if you get, if you get wines which are not certified disease-free. Um, it helps if you plant it, if you order early because then the nurseries can get ready. Um, Again, don't plan, don't try, try not to order later than October. It depends on the variety. Some varieties do have, do have, um, have waiting lists. And your stock needs to be delivered a couple of days to a week before planting that. You can keep it cool in a cooler. If it comes much earlier, you can keep it. If it's a dormant plant, you can keep it in a very cool spot or in a fridge for a couple of months. It's not ideal. But that's, that's possible. Don't leave your planting stock in the sunlight or in a, in a non-cool area or in a shed or somewhere where it gets either too cold if it freezes or it gets too warm um, in summer. So it's very important if your planting stock comes in earlier than a couple of days, make sure you, you store it in a cool climate, in a cool spot. The best thing would be with an AC. Um, so there are a couple of planting options. Manual planting is probably the one which is the, 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 the easiest, but also the most uh, 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 work intensive. If you put in bigger acreage, mechanically planted uh, might be a good idea. Um, in the mountains, usually it looks more like this. Um, and uh, what you really need is an auger, as you can see here in the picture. You need, uh, you need a couple of other instruments, buckets, soil. Um, 
And you also want to make sure that if you plant your plants, um, make sure that your root system is not uh, crumbled. So do you, if you have a dormant plant, you probably want to cut a little bit of the root system. If it's too long, make sure it fits into the planting hole, but, but make also, also sure that it's not crumbled. Fill up the planting hole with loose soil. If you grow vinifera grapes, make sure that the graft union is above the soil. And uh, if you grow muscadine grapes, make sure that you don't plant the plant deeper than it was planted in the nursery. You usually see that on the planting material where it was planted in the nursery. Um, the, the, the plants will sink in, that's normal. So you have to make sure that you have a good amount of time, a good, of, a good amount of space between those two regions. And uh, the training stake should go in um, a couple of days after planting. And, um, and the training stake, again, is usually a bamboo stake, but some people also use metal stakes. It's important for the wine, especially for the first year of establishment, to let the wine actually grow to the trellis system. So it is very important, again, that you, that you have enough space in your planting hole so that your root system is, get, get not, that your root system is not affected by the space in the planting hole. Some people, what you also can do is put in a little bit startup fertilizer in the bottom of the planting hole. Make sure that, you, that your roots will not touch the fertilizer. It's very important. So if you decide to do that, uh, you would you would like you would you would need to dig, dig a bigger hole than if you would not decide to do a starter fertilizer. Important for the first year or the first two years of planting is that the plants do get enough water. We usually don't have that problem in North Carolina, but it can be relatively dry from time to time. If you have a new planting and there wasn't rain for a week on a week and a half, and you are on the sandy soil, you probably want to go and check and make sure that you either put on your drip line or you give those plants water. They need a lot of water in the first two years to, to, to be established. Um, again, planting material, usually it's... Uh, uh, it's excuse me, I think yes. you have a few uh, questions in the chat. Do you want to take them yeah. now or... Okay, one was about um, uh, identif identifying a variety type. I have several random grapevines growing in a natural area in my yard. How do I identify which variety? Oh, that's uh, where at? So she doesn't list a location. Um, it, yeah, um, it an Andrew, area. where are you located? You can, uh, uh, Andrew, you can unmute yourself. I'll try to find you, or I can unmute you. She's in Cary, North Carolina. Oh, okay. So that's most likely muscadines then. And then, uh, then another one just popped up that yeah. um, if there is, is there anything different you would suggest for a home gardener who just wants 10 to 20 feet of grapes? We have 20 to 30 feet foot chain link fence of grapevines uh, for at a a previous demo garden in Western North Carolina that did produce grapes, purple is all we know, and some home gardeners do want to try them. And she's a master gardener volunteer. Okay, so if you are, so it really depends a little bit on the region again. If, if you are in the mountains and you have about 30 feet of trellis, what you could try is a, is a, is a Norton or Catawba if you have a high wire, if it's a high wire trellis. They, they work pretty well on the high wire. Or what you also, if you want to do wine grapes, what you also could do is a, is a Petit Menseng or something, or Petit Vado, if you don't have a high wire. Uh, and other, in the, and other variety, in the, if, if you're in the south, southern western part of North Carolina, so somewhere south Piedmont region, I would, I would try a Muscadine grapes. They need a little bit more space than the Norton would, so they really need, like, they probably eat up the whole 20, 20 foot um, space you have uh, with just one wine and um, yeah and I would it depends again what you want to do if you want to if you want to have if you want to do fresh market I would or like grapes to to eat I would do like one of those bigger varieties with, with, the, with those big grapes pork would be a good idea uh, Tara would be a good idea if you want to do a white one um, or triumph is also a good good variety 
So those would, would be the ones which I would try. Um, it really depends on your region. If you're in the mountains, I would not try muscadine, but if you're in the southern Piedmont, you definitely should try muscadine. Make sense? Mountain area 2,000 feet was the response. So, Mount Airy. So, Mount, oh. Mountain area. Mountain and area. She's in Asheville. Okay. Buncombe County. Okay. Okay, so yeah, then, then I would probably not try muscadine. I would probably use a, 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 a good variety up there is, is Catawba or, or um, even Concord grows pretty well up there or, or um, Norton can grow very well up there. So those would probably be the varieties I would, I would try. If you have a high wire trellis system, if you're on a VSP trellis system, I would, I would try a... Uh, um, Chamberson maybe or Petit Vado or Petit Manseng. Uh They reply, thanks. You're welcome. And the carry question, um, yeah, that's, that's hard. It's most likely muscadines maybe escapees from another vineyard. That happens actually pretty a lot. It's hard to identify. I, I, I mean, the, if you see some grapes on it, that might give you a hint if it's a white or a dark variety. And um, the flowers will give you a hint. If it's a perfect flower, there's a very good chance that's, that's an escapee from, from, from a breeding program or from, 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 another, uh, from another vineyard at some point. Muscadines tend to do that a lot here. And um, if it's not a perfect flower, so if it's a female or even a male, then it's very likely a wild, a wild uh, uh, muscadine. But if you have a perfect flower, it's most likely an escapee. That's not very often in nature that you have perfect flowers. Perfect flowers means you have both uh, a, a, a male and a female part to it, and they are self-fertile, which is a breeding trait. Um, and, not, uh, and that in nature doesn't happen that much. All right, any other, any other questions? I'll add a link to the chat list that um, has pictures of some of the native grapes, the wild species of grapes people might see in the woods. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, so here again, um, this is for planting material you're ordering. It's mostly for vinifera grapes. Um, you want to order really a long time before, especially if you have special varieties, which you do want to order. You want to be, you want to be early on your vinifera and French American hybrids with muscadines. It's a little bit different. You can order a little bit later, especially if you only have a few acreage or like a small amount of plants which you want to order. You can put on your order a little bit later. Again, October is the very latest. If you want to plant your grapes in, 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 in spring, um, also let your nursery know when you want to plant. Sometimes they have some leftover plants and they're going to ship it right away to you. That's a situation you do want to avoid. Uh, so talk to them and tell them this is what I, what I want. Don't order it online. If you, some nurseries let you order online, just call them. That's, that's a much better way to do it. Again, if you plant a bigger acreage, try to establish a relationship with your nursery as well. You usually order at least a year or a year and a half in advance if you try to, if, if you want to grow vinifers. Um, uh, you know, water before and after planting, uh, especially if it's dry outside, um, if it already has, if it has rained a, a day before, you probably don't want to have to water. But usually to make sure that your soil is, uh, that your soil is, um, is moist. And uh, again, if you put in a bigger acreage, some Trip irrigation is very helpful, especially in the first couple of years of grape establishment. Um, grow tubes or vine shelters um, are uh, helping for, for, for physical protection, especially if you have a lot of deer pressure. That can be a big problem in, in, in young vineyards, and it also helps you to apply herbicides. Um, it's, of course, a little bit more cost, costly. It attracts more diseases and insects. And it's more labor and labor intensive. Um, 
here a couple of resources uh, on trellis systems. Um, How to Build an Orchard and Vineyard Trellises is actually a good book. Um, so we have, generally there are two types of trellis system which are used, a low wire and a high wire system here. What you see here is what we call a low wire system. So you have basically your first wire where you train your cordon. It's basically the first wire here and then you have a couple of other wires up there um, where you basically train your spurs on. So this is a system which is used a lot in vinifera grapes here. Uh, very common is the vertical shoot positioning system trellis here with, um, um, which basically has a, a low wire where you, which is about four, foot, four to four and a half foot high where you could train your, 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 uh, your cordons and then on those cordons you train your, 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 um, your um, shoots which then have the fruit. A system which is also common for muscadines and recommended for varieties like uh, uh, Catawba or Norton or Sunbelt or Concord are high wire systems. Um, usually you have like one big wire which is, which is in about five and a half to six feet height and that's where you train your cordon and then you let your branches hang over. This is a, this is a cheaper system. It's not recommended for all grapes, but for, again, most muscadine varieties like a high wire system, as well as Catawba, Norton works very well on a high, high wire system, as well as some of the French American hybrids might actually work very well on a high wire system as well. Um, so you really, your goals for the first three years of your, of, your, of your grapes, and that's very important to understand is that you want to the first two years you want to develop a large and healthy root system and you want to establish the initial components of the desired training system. So you do not want to uh, 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 harvest fruit in the first two years of your establishment. It's very important. Your plant is very young and the energy which your plant generates needs to be developed into a root system and wood in the first two years and not into fruit. So what you actually need to do is if you see flowers on your grapes in the first two years, you do want to pinch them off and not have your grape producing fruit and flowers in the first two years. The first harvest should be in year number three, and that should be a partial harvest. So you also want to thin out, thin out about 50% of the, of, the, of the flowers in your, first, in your third year. That gives the plant the, the choice the, the, that gives the plant the opportunity, opportunity to actually grow a healthy root system and a healthy trunk and cordon system, which you need for the next 15 or 20 years where you have that grape in your, in your backyard. If you don't give the plant that opportunity, you set yourself up for a lot of problems. So that is a very, very important part. Don't harvest in the first two years. Make sure that you, that you give the plant the opportunity to develop a healthy root system, a healthy trunk, a healthy cordon so that you have your structure, your wooden structure in place before you start harvesting your grapes. Very, very important. Um, right, so again, some grapes grow different than other grapes. Vinifera grapes and hybrid grapes are usually a little bit slower than uh, most of the American varieties. Muscadines can grow very, very large in a very, very short amount of time. What you usually try to do is if you have in your first year and you, your, your plants reach the trellis system, uh, 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 reach the wire, um, you want to prune that back in the first year so that you do have a healthy root system and a healthy trunk. And then you train your cordon in the second year. So that's what you want to do usually. It really depends a little bit on the variety, but with muscadines, that's what you would do. Um, and you can see here the difference between a weaker wine and a, and a vigorous wine. Um, you can see that a, vi a vigorous wine and the muscadine is a vigorous wine can, can quickly overwhelm you with, with the shoots and the trunks it sends out. So what you're really focusing on in the first two years is the structure, this structure here and this structure here to uh, be developed. I'm running out of time, unfortunately. Um, so in the third year, you want to have a structure like this, um, 
in your in your vineyard and that is the first year where you actually also harvest fruit um, in a high wire system you want to have basically one big trunk and then you have two cordons going in, in both directions and on those cordons you have smaller spurs which actually which do have the buds of last year which will produce the fruit for this year um, and again, pruning is very important and I cannot talk about pruning uh, uh, because we're running out of time and it's really hard to demonstrate on a computer too. But we do have pruning workshops every winter and every early spring. You need to prune when the plant is dormant. With muscadines that only gives you a, a couple of months to prune, usually it's like December, January and maybe February and then you're kind of out of the window already. Um, Attend one of our pruning workshops. We had this winter, I think we had five or six this year and, and we will have again five or six next year uh, where, we, where we train how to not make big, big mistakes when pruning. Muscadines need to be pruned different than vinifera uh, grapes and uh, French American hybrids. Uh, so if you have muscadines, you need to attend a muscadine pruning workshop and if you have vinifera grapes, you need to attend a vinifera pruning workshop. Um, with vinifera grapes, you usually want to want to keep about two butts per spur. This is a spur pruning system. Again, there are other pruning systems like cane pruning systems, which I'm not talking about today. Um, with spur pruning systems, you want to keep about two butts. Usually you have like a base butt, which you don't count. Then you have, this is the first butt here, and this is the second butt here. Those are the count butts. And those are the types that you want to keep about two butts per spur and then it depending on the on the variety how many butts you want to retain per uh, grape so again muscadines are, are very different you have to retain a lot of more butts with muscadines because they are so vigorous and they need uh, some some uh, space and some butts to actually grow um Again, this is a cane pruning system. We're not talking about cane pruning today. Um, this sums pretty much everything up for a, for a low wire system. So this is, this is a low wire system. Again, you have usually with vinifera grapes, you keep a trunk or renewal spur down here, just because we have so much cold damage, it makes a lot of sense to have like a trunk renewal spur. And then you do have two to three node spurs um, on your uh, VSP. Um, canopy management is also very important. If you, if you uh, especially with, with muscadines, again, you need to hatch them a lot. Canopy management can be very different from with different varieties. So um, you see here, this is how it looks pre-hatching. Muscadine uh, vineyards uh, can look very similar and even more so often you have a couple of times where you do have to go through with, with the hatcher through a muscadine vineyard to keep it a little bit in check. It's very important, again, that you grow, that your wines don't grow too, too vigorous. Um, in vinifera vineyards, it's a little bit more complicated. There, there is a couple of things, cultural man management practices, which you need to do, especially in, in vertical shoot positioning systems, which we have a lot so on a low wire system. Um, Dormant pruning, of course, is for all of them, you know, muscadines or vinifera or French American hybrids. And then in vinifera only, you would do shoot thinning and shoot positioning and uh, leaf removal and lateral shoot removal. Those are, th those are tasks which you do in a vinifera vineyard. And then you do hatching. Hatching, again, needs to occur in, in, in with every grape, no matter what it is. A muscadine grape, you need to hatch a little bit more often than a not that vigorous vinifera grape. So again, it's a lot of work. If you put in, if you put in a larger, larger acreage of, of grapes, that can take, those kind of tasks can take a lot of labor and a lot of time. Uh, pest, weed, and disease management. I think Matt is talking about this in a second. Um, so I will not go over this. The only thing which is really important is in grapes, especially in vinifera grapes, but also in muscadines, early season and prevention of, of pests which can overwinter is very, very important. That 
if you don't do uh, if if you don't prevent uh, especially fungal pathogens, you will have problems later in the year. Um, so taking out old material, pruning out diseased wood, and uh, spraying a couple of fungicide sprays is e even in a muscadine vineyard will help you to to be more clean and more you will be more happy in the summer with this um, again this this is how it looks if you don't do a lot of canopy management um, this is a vinifera vineyard um, downy mildew is not a problem in muscadines but it is in, in vinifera grapes and you can see here that you don't even can go with your spray equipment through the vineyard because you you never did the can there there's no good canopy management so so canopy management again is a very very important part of vineyard management a very important part to control pests and pathogens and the spread of pathogens as well um matt will talk about this this is pierce's disease um If you do have problems with your wines, please talk to the plant, insect and, uh, plant disease and insect clinic at North Carolina State University. Um, and Matt is part of that. This is how cold damage looks like. Uh, this can be a trunk disease problem. If you have something like this in your vineyard that might be, you might have infected wood uh, or something like this in your vineyard, you might have, uh, if you see dying plants, you might have uh, uh, a trunk disease. This is how trunk disease look like. If you if you do your pruning wounds, you have like those black pies here. That's very common in North Carolina, especially if you got cold damage in there. Uh, so they need to be managed, and that can also affect muscadines, as you can see here. This is a muscadine vineyard. Um, some uh, resources for you, the Southern Region Small Fruit Consortium website, smallfruits.org, has uh, IPM production guides. Very important. They have every, those are integrated pest management production guides. They cover weeds, uh, insect pests, and uh, diseases, pathogens. And we have, uh, they're updated every year, and we have one for bunch grapes and one for muscadines. They're completely for free. You can print them out, put them to your truck. If you do that once a year, a new version, you put it into your truck. It has all the recommendations, every pesticide, every cultural method, everything is in there uh, for you to grow grapes. It's a very good resource. Um, that's how they look like, but again, you can print them out and just put them into uh, your truck. We also have a grape portal, grapes.ces.ncsu.edu, where we have all our resources. Um, and uh, our grape team is working on this on this website all the time. You can subscribe to it, so please do that. Uh, we have a UGA viticulture blog, which you can also subscribe to. So a colleague of mine, Kane Hickey, is, is, is doing that. And we have a, a Virginia Tech financial calculator, which help, will help you, especially if you, if you plan larger acreage, which will help you a little bit with the cost estimations uh, and uh, uh, to avoid some of the pitfalls. So uh, for wine growers, we have a wine, NCSU wine grower guide. It's also for free. It's a big book. It's a hundred, almost 200 pages, has 12 chapters, and it's completely for free. Uh, and you will find a lot of information how and where to grow uh, grapes in North Carolina. So that's it from my side. I'm running out of time. Um, if you have questions, please let me know. All right. And as Mark said, he has shared the slides as a PDF file, and I will send that out so you can review awesome. all the great information that, um, that he has given us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've also added some of the, a few of the um, resources he mentioned in the chat list, and I will send those out in the follow-up email as well. So you can check those out and have those to refer to in the future. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so all much, right. Mark for joining us today and um, sharing all the wonderful information on growing grapes and helping us realize how much it is a pre-planning process. And a lot of what we <laughs> see in the extension office is people 
saw a grape at Lowe's, they bought it and stuck it in the only spot they had in the yard, and now it's it's not doing well. So yep. we know why. <laughs> and, um, that's not the way to try to grow grapes or any fruit. So thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Um, so you're welcome to stay on. Um, next up, we have Mike uh, Munster and Matt Bertone, who are going to share with us some be on the lookout, what's going on with pests and diseases out there um, across North Carolina right now. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, I'm going to go first today. Um, let me start sharing. Let's see. All right, everybody. Anybody see? Yes. Great. All right. So um, this time of year, of course, uh, we're going to have a lot of insects becoming very active. Uh, it's finally getting warm, actually a little bit too warm sometimes uh, as we're going to get temperatures in the 90s soon. Um, oh, I just want to mention to Mark that, yeah, unfortunately, I won't be talking about grape pests today, but that would be a great subject for future um, uh, for our future uh, plants, pests, pathogens, where Mike and I talk, uh, well, maybe we'll have to coordinate a pathogens and uh, diseases and insects of grapes. I think will be a great subject, um, and I'm sure I could use your advice as well. <laughs> so, um, okay. So as far as what we're going to be seeing in uh, May, early June, you know, it's basically the end of May, but uh, we'll be coming back at the end of June to give our plants, pests, pathogens. Uh, bagworms and small caterpillars. So right now is actually the time of year where the bagworms are very small. Uh, you're not going to see them and this is the best time to control. Uh, I say you're not going to see them because they're going to be camouflaged in uh, with the foliage already making little tiny bags like this one uh, shown here. But uh, if you beat some branches of plants that have been typically infested with them in previous years, you can find the young um, larvae and uh, that's a good sign to treat that plant. Uh, young bugs, there's going to be lots of leaf-footed bugs, uh, assassin bugs, they're going to be bright red and black typically uh, to warn that they're either stinky or they can uh, bite. Uh, assassin bugs can actually jab you with their proboscis but they don't do that unless it's in defense. Um, I've actually seen a lot of young wheel bugs lately, uh, and these are young leaf-footed bugs, and I've seen several of them as well. Uh, May beetles, uh, as their name suggests, they come out around this time of year, uh, but they will be going into June. Uh, oftentimes we see these swarming lights, porch lights, when you have mass emergences of them. They're gonna be look like little kind of nuts, little chestnut, brown or red, uh, some are hairy, some are not. Uh, but if these start swarming your lights, just know that they're emerging now. Uh, they are not typically an issue. Some of them feed on leaves as adults, but really uh, you're, they're not gonna be causing any damage. They're mostly just a nuisance issue. Of course, Japanese beetles are gonna start to uh, emerge as adults right now. They have, uh, earlier in the spring, they were munching uh, in uh, soil on plant roots. Uh, typically, they're not too much of an issue, although we get outbreaks sometimes. And uh, then now they've pupated and they're going to be uh, making their adult emergence where they begin to feed on things like grape, uh, but also things like roses, uh, other rosaceous plants like caprunus trees, things like that, where they often will start to skeletonize leaves. Uh, remember that uh, Japanese beetle bags are not the best option for control. Uh, honestly, they're probably going to attract more of these beetles to your yard than they will actually trap and control. Um, so uh, the best thing to do is to scout your plants that you are uh, wanting to protect from them. Uh, typically, the plants can survive fine with a little bit of feeding damage that the Japanese beetles cause. But if you have a plant or plants that you enjoy, you can uh, either use cultural control where you knock the beetles off into buckets of soapy water to drown them, or you can use some of the approved chemical controls on those plants. Uh, some vegetable pests are going to be out and about. Uh, things like striped cucumber beetles. Uh, this is the squash vine borer uh, down here. Uh, so the adults are going to be starting to lay eggs on uh, cucurbits. Uh, we're going to have a number of other things in the gardens like squash bugs and whatnot. Uh, and uh, these will start to attack the vegetables that are starting to grow and flourish right now. 
Uh, lots of galls will be noticeable, uh, especially on hickories. You're going to see the phylloxera galls, and on oaks, you're going to start to see the galls on the leaves. Um, some of the other plants with galls are going to be witch hazel, which the aphids are just about done galling on, and uh, you're going to see a couple other groups um, on on several types of plants. And of course, the biting arthropods, the blood feeding arthropods, ticks and mosquitoes are out and about and in full force right now. I uh, learned that firsthand yesterday when I was out taking photos in the woods. Uh, lots and lots of mosquito bites uh, and several types of mosquitoes too feeding on me. So uh, be careful out there. Use some DEET or preventive sprays for uh, ticks and mites like chiggers. It's best to use permethrin uh, on your clothing or boots. Do not use that directly on your skin and follow directions, but that's, that's a good uh, pesticide for preventing ticks and mites from crawling up on your clothing in, inside uh, your clothing to your skin and feeding. Um, and with that, I will take any questions or turn it over to Mike. Uh, let's see. Let me get out of the. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right. Oh, uh, what is eating up leaves of eggplant? Flea beetles? Uh, so uh, it, it depends. You've got to kind of look under the undersides of the leaves and look uh, maybe at night sometimes. If they're very tiny shot holes, then flea beetles are a common pest of eggplants. Um, but there are lots of different pests of solanaceous plants right now. Uh, so I would definitely, there are orange egg masses. Okay, so that is likely going to be um, one of the, like Colorado potato beetle or some other uh, leaf beetle. Uh, they typically have kind of vase-like uh, egg masses, uh, very bright orange or, or yellow-orange eggs. Uh, with those types of insects, if you have a small garden and, and a small number of plants, if you see those egg masses, they can just be removed. A leaf with those egg masses can be removed and you've basically taken the number of individuals out of the population. Um, but uh, again, scouting and looking for activity uh, and looking for the different stages is gonna help with ID. Okay, see very small white eggs under my okra leaves. Any idea what that is? Um, I'd have to really see what the eggs are. If they're in little batches, there are some uh, true bugs that will have, uh, they usually have a barrel shaped egg with a little kind of uh, circular uh, line around the top that is a cap that opens up when they hatch. Uh, but there are also uh, lots of uh, moths that will lay white eggs. So um, basically uh, what the best thing to do would be to take some photos, some clear photos and send them into the clinic and we'll see what they are. Uh, again, if you're not sure, uh, you know, there can always be beneficial insects or arthropods that have eggs on plants um, that can be helpful in the garden. If you're not sure, you can always, again, remove that leaf and destroy it uh, just to make sure that you're not letting any pests emerge. Okay. All right, any other questions before I uh, turn it over to Mike? And if you have any other questions, of course, you can send me an email or send a sample into the clinic and we would be happy to look at it. All right, thank you. My microphone is working. I can see that the video is, but can you hear me? Barely. See if I can turn this up um, before I start sharing my screen here. I don't see a way to turn up the input level though. Let me. <laughs> you saw it. <laughs> let me see if I can switch. I had trouble with the headset, but let me switch to the headset and see what happens. 
one moment, please. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Can anyone hear me? Oh, yeah. That's much, yeah, much better. better. All right. I was, uh, apologize for that. Let me share here. Oh, yeah. So I, I wanted to start out. I know we're talking bolos looking forward to June, but there were a few things that were interesting happening in May that you may still see in this last uh, few days of May, and I wanted to highlight. We have had two samples in the clinic already this month with a disease I've never seen before, but according to Bill Klein, it's been common this year. It's an exobacidium leaf and fruit spot on blueberry. This is different from the one that gets on azalea and rhododendron, but it causes a bright, uh, yellow, almost yellowish green, a very light green spot on the upper surface. And on the undersurface of the leaf, it's a very pure white, at least at this stage here. And that's where the sporulation of the fungus is occurring. It will also cause some pale spots on the fruit, which you can see in the photograph as well. We got a greenhouse sample of some tomato seedlings of a couple different varieties that had early blight. And this would be a disaster if you tried to bring any of these transplants into your vegetable garden here. So again, do inspect your transplants. The very typical uh, sign or uh, excuse me, symptom of early blight is that target-like spot on the leaf or on the stem, although that isn't the 100% diagnostic character. What you need to do is see the spores actually of the alternaria in order to do the diagnosis. And third, over at the uh, shop where I take my car and my son's car, they have an apple tree planted within just a few feet of a juniper. And last week there were some wonderful spermacea of cedar apple rust there, the bright orange spots, a little bit of a red border there. And you can see how they were glistening in the sunlight. That's the oozing of the spermacea where the sexual phase of the fungus is occurring and then it will grow down through the leaf and produce the Esia and Esia spores on the underside as we get into June. And those spores will again, of course, blow over to the juniper and complete the life cycle. Very quickly, some of the bolos to look for. I put in some uh, great slides here for, for Mark. The, Details, if you want them, are back in October of 2015. Charlotte, is the recording for October 2015 on the YouTube channel or only the newer ones? It's on the YouTube channel. Everything from 2014 forward. Perfect. You said, because you said, yeah, you said 15, right? 2015, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. For those who were participating then, you'll remember that that was the year we dedicated to diagnostics and the month of October was for diagnostics of fruits, and you'll see some more details about not the only grape diseases, but also apple and strawberry and some other things. So just briefly, things that people may be asking you about on grapes and should be on the lookout for. With the bunch grapes, your downy mildew, those greasy spots on the leaves you can see there in the lower left. Also, they will infect the fruits. Anthracnose black rot on the fruit of the bunch grapes. You can see that in the photograph on the right, the beginnings of it, and also the mummified fruit there eventually. But on muscadine, that causes a leaf spot, as you see in the lower right-hand photograph. On both of these kinds of grapes, 
especially muscadine, which is extremely sensitive, you want to be on the lookout for herbicide injury. And you get a deformation typically of the leaf blade, and not just the blade, but the petiole with exposure to the synthetic auxin type herbicides like 2,4-D. Apple, as we mentioned before, cedar apple rust will be showing up. Fire blight, you may still see. And black rot, which is the same name, but a different disease from the black rot that occurs on grape. Woody ornamentals, too much to mention, but just a few things to highlight. We, of course, repeatedly talk about because it's a repeated problem, Phytophthora root rot and Armillaria root rot on different woody hosts. Flowering pears, I've already seen the fruit symptoms and signs on quince, of quince rust. You can see in the lower left there, the orange dust of those spores just coming out of the esia on the fruit. Boxwood blight, we should always be vigilant for. Rose, rose rosette, and of course, black spot, among other things, may be showing up. And on maples, anthracnose and philistica leaf spot, which can look similar, but are two different fungi. Vegetables, a lot of things could happen to cucurbits. A short list would be downy mildew. You can see it on the cucumber leaf in the lower left there. Powdery mildew as well. Anthracnose, gummy stem blight, especially on watermelon and root knot nematode. Pepper and tomato, be looking for bacterial spot, tomato spotted wilt virus, blossom end rot, and also for southern stem blight. You'll see in the lower right the photograph showing not just the necrotic stem there, the dead stem tissue, but the mycelium, the wefts and mats of the fungal growth, as well as the initials there of the sclerotia, which when the mature will become like, well, they're very like radish seeds, about the same size, shape, and color. In the flower bed, just to take a few select examples, begonias, be looking for pythium root rot and root knot nematode, which it seems to pursue very thoroughly. Powdery mildew will be showing up on things like Coreopsis, Monarda, and Zinnia. Leaf streak on daylily. With impatiens, the, the impatiens Walleriana are kind of coming back in the market now. We're getting over our fear of what happened a few years back with the downy mildew outbreak. I have reason to believe that we may be able to successfully grow these, but do be watching for downy mildew, that center photograph there. But that's not the only problem that can happen on impatiens. They are also susceptible to root knot nematode, pythium root rot, and a Rhizoctonia crown and stem blight. In the turf grasses, fairy ring can occur on any type of turf. It takes on different forms. In the photograph on the right there, you'll see the form where you get a green ring of the, the fertilizer effect of the breakdown of the material as the ring is advancing but then they, uh, you can also have dead rings and you can have mushrooms and puffballs showing up with a fun causal fungus, but I think we'll need a little bit more moisture before we see too much of that. Dollar spot can show up, and that's a disease of any kind of turf grass, and brown patch we'll be seeing in the warm weather on our tall fescue and ryegrass. The difference between a spot and a patch is interesting. Technically, a spot in turf refers to the damaged area of four inches or less in diameter. And a patch would be greater than four inches and irregular in shape. And if it's larger than four inches in diameter and round, then it's called a circle. Dollar spot, I should mention, can get greater than four inches, but um, the technical definition of the spot, as far as I understand, as a non-turf specialist, is four inches or less. Notice in the photograph on the lower right how that brown patch in the fescue stops at the line where it goes to a warm season grass. This was planted out in front of Kilgore Hall a few years ago. They've changed the turf there now, but you could see how a warm season grass is doing fine in the summer, whereas the fescue struggles a little bit <clears throat> as at a disadvantage and the fungus takes advantage of that. It's not a disease, but you may be fooled by damage that looks like disease that could out to be chinch bugs. So if you have problems on St. Augustine grass, do look for those. And there's some other additional wonderful detailed information on turf diseases, insects, and weeds available at the Turf Files website. And let me 
go now to the chat here and see if we've got any questions. Uh, I see there are three points in the chat here, okay. Uh, I guess the questions were more for Charlotte and for, uh, yeah, it's about the closed captioning and the availability of the slides. Yeah, so when you go to view those uh, recordings on YouTube, you should be able to turn on closed captioning so that it will, might not always 100% accurately <laughs> transcribe what's being said, but it will be transcribed. Um, for the slides, I do have Mark slides and I'll be sending those out when the recording is ready, probably later this afternoon or, or tomorrow. Um, with Mike, uh, Mike, your slides, were you, are you gonna be able to share those or just- I should be able to, I'll have to check with the turf folks, but uh, most of those slides I should be able to share, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, if you and Matt, um, are able to share and, and can send them to me, I will make them available to everybody through the math, uh, NCSU Garden Extension Master Gardener intranet. So it's not open to the public, but just to our Master Gardener volunteers and agents. All right, any other questions? All right, back over to you then, Charlotte. All right, thank you. Mike, and thank you, Matt. I'm gonna close this out with just a couple of things, just tell you about our feature plant for the month. So I hope you can see it now. It's the Color Guard Yucca, um, which is a native perennial that is evergreen. So it's kind of almost like a shrub, but it's not woody. And it will love to grow in full sun, but it will tolerate part shade. And it thrives in very sandy, well-drained soils, as well as well-drained to moderately well-drained clay soil. So you can grow it even in clay, as long as you don't have those really, really heavy, wet, kind of gray and pale yellow clays. And it is extremely drought tolerant, considering going into summer anytime, we want to know about drought tolerant plants, but you know, especially so far this summer, we're already seeing a lot of drought in the eastern part of the state. And um, I was just looking at our extended weather forecast from National Weather Service for the summer. And actually for the foreseeable future through 2020, they've got us at a um, high chance of seeing a, a moderate to high chance of seeing above normal temperatures. So um, this is a great plant for heat and um, can tolerate drought, but really important for our climate. We need things that are drought tolerant, but also take the opposite because we get these cycles of being very wet and then being very dry. And a lot of plants that are really great for xeric landscapes out in California and the Southwest just die here when we get into the rainy spells. But, um, but yucca filamentosa takes it both. So it's in bloom right now, which makes it really spectacular. And um, you can see the, the blossoms attract a lot of pollinators. They're not here in the picture, but if you have one at home, you can observe a lot of different interesting insects visiting the flowers. The deer don't like to eat it, which you can, if you touch the plant, you can see why it does have a sharp spike on the tip of the leaf, but the leaves are somewhat flexible. So if you fall on it, it's not gonna impale you like some species of yucca, the Spanish Spaniard and, um, that grows down at the uh, coast. This one is a little more friendly. And you can learn more about it um, on the plants database. There's a great fact sheet about it, but I did wanna mention as well that you can propagate it by root cuttings. So this means if you plant it and decide to dig it up, every piece of root left behind will probably sprout a new plant. So when you plant it somewhere, make sure it's where you want it, <laughs> because if you try to get rid of it, it's probably gonna be a long-term process um, once it's happy and established. Uh, cutting those root pieces will uh, often encourage it to sprout new plants. And the, the specific uh, species name, filamentosa, is um, referring to the little tiny hairs that uh, or fibers that curl around the sides of the leaves, just like filaments. So if you see a yucca and you're not sure if it's yucca filamentosa, which is sometimes called Adam's needle, you can look closely at the edges of the leaves to see if you see those little curling uh, fibers or filaments um, all, all, all around the edges. And this one, Color Guard, um, specifically selected for that beautiful variegation where the center is a uh, creamy yellow and the edges are green. And again, being evergreen, um, it's a really nice plant for winter and can even take on some 
kind of uh, rose and pink shades in the winter. All right, last few announcements. There's lots of great travel opportunities through the um, Extension Gardener Travel Study Adventure um, program. You can go to Italy, you can go to Spain, but the really important one, if you're interested in going to Hawaii, sign up today or tomorrow or by the end of the week because registration does close by May 31st. And um, you can learn more about these travel opportunities um, on the portal. I think I'm going to drop that in. Yeah, I just dropped a bunch of links into the chat list and I will send these out as well um, in the follow-up email. So we'd love to see you on some of these trips. And if you want to get the Extension Gardener Handbook while UNC Press has it 40% off, make sure and place your order by the end of next month. You go straight to the UNC uh, Press website to order it for 40% off. They have the code up in the top of, of the website. So you don't need a special code from me or from NCSU Garden. The code is right there on the UNC Press website to get it 40% off. So that is quite a deal. And we really look forward to seeing you next month when uh, Matt and Mike will be up to give us much more in depth um, features on insects and pest problems. In fact, uh, Matt is going to be traveling. So we have um, a guest speaker coming to us from North Carolina Department of Agriculture who's specifically going to talk to us about spotted lanternfly, which we hope is a pest that doesn't make it to North Carolina, but it does look like it's coming our way. Um, so that will be June 25th, and we look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, you'll be able to find the recording for today, and as I said, everything back through 2014 on the YouTube playlist, and also they are posted on our website where we have the schedule and the archives. So until we meet again, I wish you all happy gardening, and I um, hope to see many of you next week at Master Gardener College.